Good morning. It's been a good day already. Uh, beautiful to see small children uh, prayed over and, and parents as well. It's been a good, good day. Uh, we are continuing on in our series of uh, BLESS, uh, the acronym B-L-E-S-S, uh, which stands for Before Anything Else Pray. We talked about that last week. Uh, today we're talking about listening and how important it is to listen, and I think outside of prayer, uh, which prayer is part of an exercise in listening, listening is probably the most important part. Uh, then E, which is my favorite, eat, love eating, love that one, it's my favorite, I like that one, it's capital, like in an extra big font. And then there's S, we're going to serve, we're going to look for ways to serve other people, and then we're going to share, we're going to share our story uh, with those around us. And so this week, as I was looking for examples of uh, people listening or not listening, which sadly in our world today is really easy to find, I just open up the news uh, and it's a whole bunch of people not listening to each other. At least that's what it seems like. To me, I was struck by uh, my friend, uh, not actually hit by my friend, that sounds strange, uh, but I was struck by a story my friend told me uh, about, uh, he lost power during the, the snowstorm we had a couple weeks ago. And uh, he texted one of his buddies. And he said, hey, man, can you pray for me? I, I, we, we're 40 degrees uh, in the house. My, I got two small kids. Can you pray for us? And his friend sent back, I still can't believe this happened, sent back a link to an article explaining that the reason there was power failure was because the windmills had frozen in Texas. Which, regardless of what you think about how or how the, the power outages happened or didn't happen, could that have been a worse response to someone crying out in need? Hey, here's an article explaining why you're in the awful situation you're in. Great, I'll, I'll read this, you know, while I'm trying to charge my phone in the five minutes that I have power. Thank you. It just, it's just complete, completely tone deaf, completely uh, unaware, unempathetic about what somebody is going through. And I find this is regularly happening, not just in our culture, it happens in our relationships with other people. We talk past one another. We're not able to listen really effectively or well. And that is not Christ-like. Christ is an excellent listener. We're going to see that today, and we're going to see how we might learn to listen as Christ listened. And so we're going to be in John chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 26. Uh, and this passage is not about listening. So I'm just going to go ahead and be upfront about that. This passage is not about listening. It's about Jesus revealing himself uh, to this uh, Samaritan woman, telling her that he's the Messiah. And so it's exciting. It's, it, it's, a, it's a part of John's narrative moving, moving forward. But within this, Jesus allows the woman to drive the conversation. Rather than ambushing her and saying, hey, I'm the Messiah, now go tell everybody, he actually allows her to speak with him, and they engage in a dialogue. And so today we're going to look at three aspects of listening that you see Jesus doing in this passage. And the first one is he listens to the person, listens to the person. He doesn't pass judgment on her. He just Listens. And so in this story, Jesus is leaving Judea. Uh, he's going back to Galilee. And this is actually because his disciples and John the Baptist's disciples are in conflict. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of competing over, over uh, space to minister. And so Jesus says, all right, we're packing up. We're heading back uh, to Galilee. And we pick up the story in verse 4. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So there's a lot of cultural, historical baggage here between Jewish people and Samaritan uh, people. There's a lot of historical problems, but the shortest route to get from Judea north to Galilee was through Samaria. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, well this was really unique. A lot of Jews circumnavigated. They didn't, they didn't go through uh, Samaria because it was considered to be unclean. Well, the alternate route was to go through Gentile-controlled territory which was also a problem for Jews. So more than likely, most people took the short route through Samaria, even if they were Jewish people. But it says here, and I love this, in verse, uh, verse four, uh, sorry, yeah, verse four, and he had to pass through Samaria. Some people read this as a divine imperative, meaning he had to, he was under obligation by the leading of the Holy Spirit to go through Samaria. And you might say, well, why? To meet with this woman. He has an appointment. This woman's unaware of it, but he has an appointment 
to meet with this woman. And so what's unique about this story is that the woman is, is just completely the wrong kind of person that you would think that the Messiah would first tell himself to. She's from the wrong group of people. She's living the wrong kind of lifestyle. And in that day and age, she was from the wrong gender. This woman is wrong. And on top of that, Jewish men were not supposed to be alone with women in any context unless it was your family member. So she shows up at the wrong time. Everything about this is wrong. And God's divine plan for us to move the kingdom forward, for us to listen to other people, will always, usually, sorry, involve us meeting with the wrong kind of people at the wrong time. People always show up at the wrong time, right? I had this happen uh, in the midst of the blizzard. My, my, uh, my neighbor that I'm praying for uh, showed up. Uh, we were walking through the alley uh, with the girls, and it was cold, and we were trying to get them back home because it was so cold. And, and there, there's my neighbor right there. And I'm like, oh, man, Lord, this is not the right time to be talking to my neighbor about you. I need to get my kids, my babies home. They freeze them. And I was like, nope, this is the time. It was such an inconvenience. It was the wrong time. It's the wrong time. Or we have the wrong kind of people, right? We don't see how this person can help us. We don't see the advantage that this person can give us. This is the wrong kind of person. This isn't the person I should be sharing with. Or they're from the wrong group. The wrong person, the wrong group. And this isn't the kind of person I associate with. Look, if you wait for all the stars to line up just perfectly and make this person the right person at the right time for you to speak with, to listen to them, to what they have to say, you're never going to listen to anybody, ever. Because it's never going to happen. It's always going to be wrong. And what we do when we determine that it's the wrong time or the wrong person or the wrong group or the wrong whatever, we're judging this person right off the bat and saying, I don't have time for you. I don't have, this isn't important. Enough. This is the wrong situation. And we, we dismiss them out of hand and we decide not to listen to them. So Jesus has all this happen to him in this story. So let's see how he navigates these, uh, these sort of wrong categories. The first one is he allows himself to be inconvenienced. Look back at verse six. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey. Think about that. Son of God. God never tires or rests, but the son of God here is wearied. He's tired from his journey. Wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is about noon, which was hot. It's blistering. Now, how many of you have ever been on a road trip before? Online, maybe, here and there, you've been on a road trip before? And you've been in like a car with a bunch of people that when you started out, you were friends. But as the road trip progressed, you were not friends anymore. If you've ever been on a road trip, especially with a bunch of guys, a bunch of bros, it stinks, it's obnoxious, it's always the wrong kind of music to listen to. And Jesus has been traveling with 12 dudes a long way through dusty, dusty ground. And if this is me, the reason why I'm sending him into town to buy food is because I just need a break. I'm just going to sit here by this well. I don't care that it's hot and I'm going to have some me time. Y'all go get some food. I will starve just to not be around other people for a while. And here comes this woman. And again, if this is me, I'm like, oh my gosh, please don't talk to me. Just get your water and go tired. I just want some quiet time. But he allows himself to be inconvenienced. This is an inconvenience. Like I said, it's the wrong time. It's the wrong time. You can't be by yourself with this woman. In fact, Jewish custom would have, would have said that Jesus should have stood up and withdrew 20 feet from the woman so that she would have known it was safe and appropriate to approach the well. And Jesus is just sitting there like, yep, this is the person I'm supposed to talk to. Inconvenience, I think, is the number one reason why we don't listen to people. It's just not convenient. People run their mouths. Oh, they talk. You're going to be saying that by the time this is over. You're going to be like, God, he talks and talks and talks and talks. Just get worn out from it. You think they may want us to do something? Like, ah, he's going to want me to listen. And then at the end, he's going to spring on me. He wants me to help him move a couch because I have a truck. Just don't buy a truck. It's problem solved. I have enough problems of my own. Oh my gosh, I have enough problems of my own. I can't put up with another person's burdens. I've got my own issues. To listen to other people, we have to be willing to be inconvenienced. That's the bottom line of service. And listening is a service. You may not think it, but it is. And to serve, we have to allow ourselves to be inconvenienced. 
And when we refuse to listen because it's inconvenient, we are telling someone, we're making a judgment call, you are not worth my time. You're not worth my time. Notice also that Jesus is humble. Look at verse seven. A woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now you might say, wow, that doesn't sound very humble. He like commands this woman. This woman has to serve a man, golly. It's actually very humble what Jesus does here. One, Jesus doesn't need anything from anyone, right? So John is the, is the, book of, is the gospel where Jesus uh, turns water into wine. So I'm pretty sure he could just turn thin air into water if he wanted to. Or he could just simply rehydrate his body. The man, the man could do anything. He's the God man. But he allows this woman the opportunity to contribute. And what's more is this give me a drink of water is not the imperative way that we read it. It's not a command. There's a Greek uh, form of the imperative called the imperative of request. And this is one of the textbook examples of it. The number one way that it's used in the Gospels and in, in the New Testament is this imperative of request is used in prayer. You don't command God. You don't tell God, give me this. You say, God, please, would you give me this? But in Greek, you use an imperative of request. This is an imperative of request. We just translate it like a command. Jesus is speaking to this woman in the same tone that he would address his father. He'd say, would you please give me a drink? I'm thirsty. And it's nice for this woman, eventually, I think she'll see, she has something to contribute. People like to feel needed. People like to feel important. People like to feel like they have something of value that they can give. And if we're going to listen to people, we have to have this posture of humility. You don't have everything you need in life. You don't. But what happens to us is we think that if we have our little group, we have our church, we have our family, we have our job, we have our car, we have everything we think we need, when somebody approaches us and wants to speak with us, we think, ah, there's nothing that they can give me. And so we tend to not listen because we think there's nothing they can give us. Because we have a very narrow view of what we need. We don't think that maybe in listening to them, God wants to impart something from them to us. Maybe the four people that you're praying for over this Lenten period in our Lenten guide that we have that I hope you'll pick up if you haven't yet. Maybe the reason why you're praying for those four people isn't so that you can impart some glorious wisdom to them, but so that they might impart something to you. But we don't listen because we think we've got it all that we need. That is a posture of arrogance. It's one of the most condescending things we do as Christians is we think because we know the Savior, we have everything else figured out too. That's not true. It's not true. But he also sees her as a person. Look at verse nine. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In the Greek it reads, how do you, have, how do you want any uh, water from me? Someone from Samaria, a woman on top of that. Like as a Jewish man, I know you don't respect my, my ethnicity and you don't respect my gender. I know that about you. And what's cool about Jesus is he just sees a person coming up to get water. The woman is still seeing him in the categories of, of that, that, that she's been taught when raised from a little girl that Jewish people won't like her because of who she is. She's been raised to understand this. So when she sees a Jewish man sitting by a well, she's like, oh, here we go. So many of us don't know how to talk to a person. We know how to talk to a category of a person. I know the things I can say and the things I can't say to a Republican. I know the things I can say and can't say to a Democrat. I know the things I can and can't say to a, a different race or a different ethnicity. I know the things I can say to somebody that's of a sexual orientation other than mine, but I don't know how to talk to an individual from one of those categories. Basically, when I interact with somebody who's different from me, my goal is to exit that conversation without putting my foot in my mouth. Because we live in an arena and a day when political correctness and cancel culture is rife. And we are deathly afraid of being politically incorrect, even if we don't like political correctness. We don't want to be labeled as something we're not. And so we just get terrified. Somebody that's different from us is like a boogeyman. We're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. We don't see them as a person. We see them as a representative of a category that's perhaps out to get us. And often the only listening we do 
is we're listening for a way to exit the conversation or we're listening for a place that we can insert some fact we've picked up, some piece of knowledge that we have so that we can divert the conversation away from something that we're not good at talking about. We have to listen with truth, with compassion, with love. Listening to a person, not a category of people. So we need to listen without judgment. Listen to a person. But it's also important because when we're listening, we think we just listen with our ears, right? We open up our ears. That's an important, that's difficult for us to do. Trust me, it's very hard. But we also need to listen with the heart. Let's talk about listening with the heart. This is empathy. We need to be empathetic to what's going on. Verse 10, Jesus says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you'd have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, this is a very common metaphor in scripture. Living water is very important uh, in, in that day and age. In fact, you still value living water over water that's not living. Living water is running water. If I were to offer you water that I just got out of a tap or water that had been pooling in my kitchen sink for a week, which would you like? We still like living water. And so Jesus is saying, I can get you living water. Now, Jacob's well is kind of a conundrum, okay? So Jacob's well is very important. It was dug by Jacob, the patriarch himself. And Jacob's well is actually kind of a trick because even though it's well water, which kind of implies like the gathering of water, it's like a cistern or something, it's not that. It's actually furnished by an underground spring. So Jacob's well is kind of this like hybrid of running water versus well water, and it's really nice. It's a good, uh, best drinking water probably in the area. And so this woman's making trips out to this well to get water in a particularly difficult time of the day to do it because it's so good. And so Jesus says, I can get you living water, which is a flexible metaphor. We see it a lot in the Old Testament, this comment on living water. God actually uses it in Jeremiah too. He says that my people have traded the living water that I can give them worship and service to me, the love that I have, and instead they've traded it for water out of broken cisterns, broken cisterns being like jars, water collecting uh, units that they would have. And they're saying that idol worship, uh, pursuing things, for finding other th- uh, fulfillment in other things, that's water out of a broken cistern. It's not going to satisfy them. And Jesus is kind of using this as a flexible metaphor. And he's saying, I can give you some better water than this. And the woman responds, uh, again, continuing on in her skepticism and sarcasm of this Jewish man who's standing there. Uh, The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. She says, this well water, you're going to have to work really hard to make it better because it was dug by Jacob. Both the the person that dug the well and the quality of the water makes it a superior source of water. And Jesus is saying, well, yeah, you know what? You're right about that. The only way to really make this water better would be if you found a source of water that you drank once and were never thirsty again. And she makes a concession. She's like, yeah, fair enough. Like, if you can find that water, I'm in. Let's do it. Jesus is doing something here that we we do very rarely. Jesus listens to her. But we think, again, listening is just with our ears. Listening is also making observations, making deductions. uh, Jesus sees this woman and sees one very obvious need that she has. We're not reading on in the rest of the passage. Forget everything you've ever known about the Samaritan woman. What is one very obvious need that she has? Water. She's thirsty. She needs water for something. And so Jesus says, hey, let's talk about water. He's listening to the situation in, his, in her life. And while deep hurts and deep longings might be buried beneath the surface of a person, and we don't discern those things straight away, if we listen with our hearts and open our eyes and listen with our ears to see the whole person, we'll see something that they need. This woman, we'll learn, has some deeper hurts, some, some longings in her life. But Jesus doesn't see her as just a random person. He sees her as a person who has uh, quality and value and he has empathy for her. And this is what the incarnation is. The incarnation is, is God's son dwelling amongst men, being empathetic to our situation. God doesn't look at our sinful state, our broken state, and say to himself, man, stinks, guys. I'm going to send him a cool breeze. That's going to help with the sin situation. Like, 
Y'all just feel better. Hashtag praying for you guys to myself. It's not how it works. The son of God puts on flesh, dwells amongst men because he is empathetic to our situation. The son of God gets tired because we are weary. This is what God does. God listens to the cries of his people. In Genesis 15, he listens to the cry of Abraham. Abraham says, my, I'm blessed, sure, but my life is meaningless because I don't have a kid. I don't have a son. And God listens and provides. He hears Israel enslaved in Egypt and he delivers them. He hears David in the Psalms crying out for mercy after his murder of Uriah and his affair with Bathsheba and God gives him mercy. He hears Israel languishing in exile and he brings them home. And over all of this, these are just surface level needs. I know that sound that way. But to God, they are service level needs to the deeper needs that are in every human being's life, which is the need to be forgiven, the need to be redeemed, the need to be restored to that which we were created to be. And so when Abraham's crying out for a son, God hears, yeah, you need a son, but you also need a savior. When Israel's crying out for deliverance, he says, yeah, you need freedom from Egypt, but you also need freedom from sin. When he cries out, when the Israelites cry out, Say, we need to come home. God's like, yeah, you need to come home to me, not just to a land. Because God listens to the deep cry of our heart, even when we don't know what we're expressing. And he sends his son to die on the cross for you and for me because the deep longing of our heart is to be in relationship with our father, even if we don't know it. And he meets that need for us. You can put your faith in him today. You can trust that I don't have to do anything to earn God's grace. That's what we were praying for these babies today. That they would become aware at some point in their beautiful lives that they would wake up to the realization that their God loves them no matter what. And that he sacrificed his child so that the child and the children of these parents could be close to him. And he wants that for you too. People's voiced needs will always point you to their greater, deeper needs if you've prayed for ears to hear and eyes to see. Anger can point to insecurity. Sadness can point to grief. Happiness and humor can actually point to somebody just wanting attention, which we are very starved for, and I think, in our day. If we're unwilling to dig surf uh, deeper than these surface levels, it's why we don't get further in our relationship with people. We keep everybody at arm's length. So how can we do this? How can we listen with our heart? Uh, Ken Sandy wrote a book called Peacemaker, uh, which is a book about conflict resolution, but he has some great ideas about listening, which is important in conflict resolution. And when I bring these ideas up, these aren't just for, for talking with one of your four people. These can be used in your marriage, in your friendships, with people at school. Uh, these are great strategies for listening. One of the first ones is wait. Wait. Jesus does this just by hanging out at the well. He's waiting on this woman to show up. We often interrupt people before they're, they're done talking. Because we assume talking shows that we're listening. It's like, oh, this is called active listening. No, that's called interrupting. Or worse, we assume that we'll lose control of the conversation. So if I wait to speak, the conversation's gonna go down a rabbit hole that I don't know anything about and I'm gonna show that I'm an idiot. And so I'm gonna keep the conversation on topics that I know things about. Baseball, history, and that's all I know about in my life. So we're gonna keep them really narrow. Or we think that waiting means that will miss out on an opportunity to contribute or correct this person. Let me say this. You will probably never impart some piece of wisdom to a person in their life that will mean more than the fact that you listened to them. The greatest impact you can have on their life is not offering them some wisdom, short of the gospel. But it is just listening. With open ears and an open heart. It shows that when we wait to speak, we take care of their needs, that we can be trusted, that we're not insecure, that we love them. Everyone's looking for safe spaces nowadays. You can be that safe space if you listen. We also need to pay attention. One of the problems, again, we have with people listening is that people just take forever to get anywhere. And our minds process information faster than people can talk. So by the time I finish this sentence, you already know where I'm going with it, which allows you freedom to wander. What are we gonna have for lunch today? What's going on in my life next week? I'm gonna plan my calendar. I'm gonna pull out my phone. Oh, he's talking again. I don't know where he's going anymore. Paying attention is key. Don't look around. Don't look around for something better to do or to talk about. Don't have negative body language crossing your arms. I stand like that sometimes. It's, it's probably just an insecurity, but try not to cross your arms. 
and pay, make, maintain eye contact. It's, it's really quite simple. Ask questions. This is one of the ways we show we're listening is to ask questions. This is different than I think interrupting. But it's especially like clarifying questions. Like, hey, you said this. Did you mean that? Because that's what I heard. All right, can you give me an example of what you mean by that? Or how are you dealing with that? Man, you just told me something really heavy. You've had a rough week. How are you dealing with that? Or you just told me something really incredible. How are you celebrating that? And if you listen and ask questions well, you know what's going to happen? It's going to automatically lend itself to the E, to the eat. Because when you say, hey, how are you dealing with that? And somebody's like, well, I'm I'm not. I'm going to go home and binge watch Netflix. And you can say, well, hey, why don't we go get a cup of coffee and you talk about that? And now we're in E. Just real seamless. Hey, how are you celebrating that promotion? Well, I'm not. I'm probably just going to go home. Let's go have dinner. Come on. Let's celebrate. Then find a point of agreement. Jesus and the Samaritan woman agree on one thing. Somebody then great, the greater than Jacob needs to show up and make a better water source. What they don't agree on yet is that Jesus is the person that's going to do that. You can find something to agree with, with anybody. Even the most combative person, you can be like, yeah, okay, I agree. with. Fine. Talk about the sky, it's blue. Like, just find something to agree on. And, and I've noticed uh, in, in arguments with my, with my wife, uh, we've only had like three in our marriage. I'm just kidding. Um, in argument, and I've lost all three of them. Um, when, we, uh, when we argue with somebody, what I've noticed with, with my arguments with my wife is she'll sometimes say something where I make a point and she'll say, that's fair. And when she says that, you know what it does for my body language? Like, like I get less combative. I'm like, oh, like I'm not, I'm not crazy. Like I am seeing something here. Just simply agreeing with somebody about something is very freeing for the other person. They, they, it relieves them of the burden to like convince you of everything. And we're afraid to even make a concession because we always want to be right and that means not being wrong ever. Make a point of agreement. So now a couple of times today, if you've been paying attention in the story, uh, Jesus has done some things that you're like, yeah, he's listening really well. Like he doesn't have to ask questions because he knows everything, right? Well, so Jesus has a, a, an advantage Uh, that you might think that we don't have, but there is a way that we can listen like Jesus. It's called listening to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. Uh, Jesus knows a lot about this woman already. Let's read uh, verse 16 where he kind of reveals what he knows. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Basically, he'll sort all this out. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He says, go call your husband, come back, and we'll talk about this. And this woman admits, like, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yeah, I know where your broken cisterns are. That's relationships with men. That's where you're trying to get your validation. That's where you're trying to get your meaning. And so you go to one man, and and it's nice for a while, and then he winds up being a broken cistern, like finding purpose in all human beings will be, and you move on to the next one. And the next one, and the next one. This woman is looking for living water. She doesn't realize it, but she is. And she's trying to find it in relationships with men. That's her broken cistern. And what I realized this week as I, as I was reading this passage is that I've taught this passage and, and I've heard it taught uh, this way. The woman, uh, the, Jesus kind of hits on a sensitive subject, right? The, the, the uh, adulterous relationship she has. And she wants to change the subject. I don't know that that's what's going on here. By Samaritan standards and by Jewish standards, this woman is leading a sinful, promiscuous life. Neither Samaritans nor Jews would have approved of the way she was living. She would have been ostracized in either society. And so Jesus says, go call your husband. She says, I don't have one. And then she starts talking about worship. One of the primary ways that you worship is confession and repentance, right? And in Israel's day, in in Jesus' day, what you did to uh, confess and repent was you brought sacrifice. You sacrificed an animal and offering atonement. Because there's no forgiveness without uh, without the blood. And so I think what this woman is saying here is, 
my people tell me I've got to go up on this mountain to make a sacrifice to be right with God, to get forgiveness of the state that I'm in. You tell me I have to go down to Jerusalem to get forgiveness. And I'm not allowed down there because I'm a Samaritan woman. So according to you, I'm stuck in my sins. I am hopeless. So what does it matter? What I do, because I can't be forgiven for what I've already done. And Jesus says to her, that's not true. A day is coming and is now here when you can seek forgiveness and a relationship with the Father from anywhere you are. You're not gonna be tied to a location. And I think this is why he says salvation is from the Jews. Saying salvation is gonna come from the people of the Jews. And in fact, I'm here. And the woman says to him, yeah, it's all kind of confusing and the Messiah is gonna sort this out. And Jesus says, I'm here and I am. I am sorting this out. Jesus listens by listening to the leading of the Spirit. Jesus leads, uh, is led by the Spirit. His whole ministry, his whole life, he's led by the Spirit. It's an opportunity that we have to be led by the Spirit as well. Because often those broken cisterns that we seek, that we want to look for, are hidden. They're very well hidden. But you know who knows where they are? The Spirit of God. And so when we listen to people, we need to listen for where the Spirit is leading us to the broken cisterns. And we need to have a prayerful attitude because if we don't enter into listening with other people with an attitude of prayer, you know what we're gonna do? Rather than leading them away from their broken cisterns to living water, we're just gonna lead them to our broken cisterns. They're gonna trade their political beliefs for our political beliefs, their doctrine and theology for our doctrine and theology. We're not gonna take them to living water of Jesus Christ unless we are led by the Spirit because that's how we found it in the first place. So how do we do that? One, start every day by praying that your ears would be open to what the Spirit's wanting to do in your life and in conversation with other people. It has to start with prayer and a posture of prayer. When that conversation starts, you're like, Lord, I can see this is where this is going. Please help me to listen well and just point me to the broken cisterns. And then just by listening, you show that you're trusting the Spirit because you're not trying to control the conversation. Trusting the Lord is best evidenced by listening. Because you're saying, Lord, take this thing where it's going to go. I'm not going to control it. You don't have to try to prove the person wrong. If we enter into every conversation as a win-lose, by Jesus' standards, I think you've already lost. You're not going to win that one. So listening is really hard. I think it's really difficult. I think it's the hardest one of the, of the letters to do. Because we like to talk. And we think we have a lot to say. And maybe we do. But we need to be willing to listen. We need to listen to people as people, not to see them as a group of people, but as a person, as an individual. Allow yourself to be inconvenienced. And then listen to, uh, to your heart. Listen to their heart. Make observations. Wait. Be patient. Ask questions. And then listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I promise you, you will become, as Jesus says, in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You will be a source of living water for people. If we will just learn to listen. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are good because, Lord, you listen to us. That's mind-blowing, Lord. You are the creator of all things, and we are so, so very far beneath but Lord, you listen to us and you hear our prayers. And so God, I pray that you would hear the hearts of your people today. Um, whatever's burdening them, whatever's wounding them today, Lord, I pray that you would hear their cries and you would heal them. I pray you would comfort them today, Lord God. And I pray that you would open our ears and our eyes to be better listeners to those around us. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.